In this video, I'm going to try and maximise my Sunlu S1 Turbo mod to see if I can improve its drying efficiency further. I'm also going to show you how you can do the same modifications to your S1 with a step-by-step -step build guide. As always, let's start by looking at why this video is needed. The Sunlu S1 Turbo mod is a great improvement over the standard S1, but there's still some room for improvement. If you haven't seen the original Turbo mod, then let's have a quick recap Netflix style. In this video, we're going to take the averagely performing Sunlu filler dryer S1 and modify it to max out its filament drying potential, but it's let down by the fact that the moist air is trapped inside the box. Anyway, let's put some of these theories to the test. That just all sounds really complicated. I'm going to cut a hole in the back of the box and run an extractor fan. But I've designed and 3D printed a flap vent that the fan can push open when it's running. We can see that the fan does open the flaps, but only a little bit. The first fan died, and just to be sure, I wired up and fried another one. The normally open thermal switch in series with the fan. Right, let's test it. Amazingly, after only 12 hours, the foam was 43.7 grams lighter. This means that this simple extractor fan mod makes the Sunlu S1 six and a half times more effective at drying the foam than the standard unit is out of the box. I think we can safely say that if you want to get the best performance out of a filament dry box, then this mod's really worth doing. So even though the Mark 1 massively improved the S1's ability to dry, there's still some room for improvement. The two main faults on the Mark 1 are, one, the box doesn't get hot enough. The airflow caused by the fan running constantly doesn't allow the air inside the box to get hot enough. The heat is needed because the hotter the air and filament, the more the little moisture molecules will bounce around and be released from the filament. This was happening with the standard S1, but that was the end of the story. The warm, damp air just sat there, or worse, condensated back into liquid when it hit the cool side of the box. So we need to get the indicated box temperature back up to 55 degrees from the 45 degrees that we had with the Mark 1 Turbo Mod. The second issue is that there's no air intake. In order for the extractor fan to remove damp air from the box efficiently, we need to replace that air with something. With the Mark 1, we needed to leave the little holes in the front of the box open or even crack the lid slightly to allow any real airflow. But this meant that the box couldn't be completely sealed when the fan turned off, which we need. These faults didn't go unnoticed by you and I had many comments on how to improve things. Some suggested a smaller fan or slumming the fan down. Some suggested an intake vent in the front of the lid to let in some air. Many suggested controlling the fan with a timer so that we could periodically let the damp air out. With the fan timing control, we could then add an intake vent which would let as much air in as we like, just as long as it closed when the fan goes off. Okay, before we get ahead of ourselves, let me just show you how to mod your Sunlu S1 to add the extractor fan, as many have said that what I did in the first video wasn't that easy to follow. The tools you'll need for this are shown here and listed in the description below. You'll need to buy the fan and the thermal switch if you don't already have them, and potentially even the relay board if you want to do the timer mod as well. You'll also need some wire and potentially some fasteners depending on how many of these mods you want to do. First, remove the lid and put some tape on the back so you can mark up the fan holes. The fan should be mounted central and the center of the large hole should be between 70 and 75 millimeters from the bottom of the lid. Once you have the center of the hole marked, draw a box 32 by 32 millimeters and drill three millimeter holes in the corners of this box. The large hole needs to be somewhere between 30 and 38 millimeters in diameter. Make sure you download and print all of the files needed as you go. All of the files for the 3D printed parts are free and available from the links down in the description. Start with the vent housing and the 40 millimeter fan blades. The blades may need a little cleaning up so that they move freely on the pins. The pins for this need to be made from 0.9 millimeter wire cut to 47 millimeters long. The fan and the fan shroud sit on the inside, but everything else is on the outside of the box. I redesigned the blade shield on the Mark 1 so that now when you open the box, it clears the plug. Next, we need to disassemble the front panel and the heating element from the base. You need to be very careful when removing the front panel. Turn the box upside down and push down firmly with something that won't mark the plastic on the bottom surface to release the clips. Once it's pushed down, you can gently prise the lower edge away. With the cover off, it's very easy to unscrew the control board and unplug everything from the back. Now you can remove the rollers and unscrew the four screws that hold the element in place and remove it. At this point, you have two options. You can either just wire the fan directly up to the 24 volts through a thermal switch, as I did in the first video, or you can add the timer relay that I'm about to test later in the video. If you're going for the simple option, then wire your fan negative directly to the negative pin on the back of the power socket. This is the one with the black wire. Then wire one side of your thermal switch to the plug positive and the other side to the fan positive. If you're adding the relay, things get a little more involved. First, print off the left-hand side plate. This should line up with the rear section of the base as shown. Tape it in place and drill through the 5mm hole. Remove the plate and tap out the holes for the cover bolts with an M3 tap. Fit the relay with M2.5 by 5mm screws. I didn't tap these holes because I didn't have an M2.5 tap. I just ran the screws through a few times until they cut their own threads. Now you can use double sided tape to attach the plate to the side of the base. Make sure the holes are lined up as you do. Now we can wire it up. 
First, wire one side of the thermal switch to the positive pin of the socket, as in the simple option. But then instead of wiring straight to the fan, feed the other side of the switch out of the side hole. Also, wire together the two wires for the switch plug, so that the relay is constantly activated when it has power. Connect the plug for the relay power connector, and run the red wire to the bottom of the board, and connect both this and the switch positive feed wire to the middle terminal at the bottom of the board. Run the black wire from the power connector through the hole so that it can reach the box power plug. You may have to extend this if the wire isn't long enough. Solder both this board power negative and the fan negative directly to the negative pin on the main power plug. Run the fan positive through the inside of the box and out of the hole to the on terminal on the relay. Now everything is connected, the relay board will only have power when the thermal switch is heated above its switching temperature. The fan will only then receive power when the timer relay allows it. There are a couple of jumper plugs on the relay board that you also need to check. Firstly, you want the one shown here to be in the cycle position, and the timer pin to be in either position 1 to adjust between 0 and 3 minutes, or position 2 for 0 to 30 minutes. We'll set up the timing later once everything's reassembled. Print the left hand side cover so you're ready to attach it when you finish playing with the timer settings. I have included right hand side panel parts to add an intake vent to the lower rear right hand side. It's up to you if you want to use this location or put the vent in the front of the box, but you can decide after seeing how they both perform. Either way, print all of the parts for the 20mm vent. This is the same setup as the 40mm vent, except it only has two blades and not three. The pins are the same but only 30mm long. Again, check that everything moves freely as you assemble. My pins were able to slide out, so I dabbed a very small amount of contact adhesive on the ends. Don't use any glue that's too thin though, because it will likely work its way into the mechanism and stop the vent from opening. This 20mm vent assembly is designed to push onto the inside of the right hand side cover, or onto the vent mounting plate into the front of the lid. Wherever you fit it, just make sure that the blades are hanging down so that they shut fully. Now reassemble the heating element, control board and front cover. I did try printing a clip from PETG to hold the wiring in the back corner, but it didn't survive testing. Instead I made one from a small piece of aluminium, which is fine. Now with everything reassembled, we can check your wiring and set up the relay timer. Connect the power and nothing should happen. Set your sunloo to heat up to 55 degrees, and when the element reaches your thermal switch switching temperature, you should get a red, and at least for a while, a green light on your relay board. Now we can turn our attention to the two potentiometers on the board. One that has the word on next to it controls the amount of time the fan will be on for. The other one that has off next to it controls, you guessed it, the amount of time that the fan's off for. Clockwise is a shorter amount of time and anti-clockwise is a longer amount of time. I was initially aiming for the fan to come on for approximately 20 seconds every 30 minutes. To set your time, turn both pots all the way in the clockwise direction and the relay should start clicking the fan power on and off. Very carefully turn the on pot a tiny amount anti-clockwise and the amount of time the green light comes on will get longer. You'll need to use a little bit of trial and error to get the green light to come on for the amount of time you want the fan to be on. Once you set the on pot you can either do the same for the off or you can do what I did and turn the off pot fully anti-clockwise for the maximum 30 minutes. All that's left to do now is fit any side covers and try it out. Once you know that everything's working how you want you can use a little bit of silicon sealant to seal up any gaps and the holes that the wiring comes through. To fit the front vent Take the front of the lid as you did the back and mark and drill a hole as close to 23.5mm as you can. I put my hole centre 55mm up from the bottom of the lid. If the hole in your lid ends up too big you may have to glue the mounting plate in rather than it just sitting there like mine did. So now we have a fan fully controllable with a timer and two intake vent options. Also I'm going to experiment with different fan speeds by adding a resistor in line with the fan positive. You could easily add a linear potentiometer here to adjust things on the fly. If you're enjoying this video, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. I make regular content to help you with 3D printing and other projects. Now we've given ourselves a huge amount of variables to try, and I spent a good couple of weeks testing out what works and what doesn't. I'm not going to bore you with all the results, but I will give you the highlights. We found that the Mark 1 Turbo Mod gave us a foam drying efficiency of 3.64 grams of water per hour. That's pretty good, and is going to be tough to beat. First I tried testing the side intake vent. Not surprisingly, with the fan on full speed and now more air coming in, the heating element that struggled to stay above 45 degrees didn't cope very well, and I definitely had too much airflow. So then I brought in the timer and only had the fan activated and the airflow through the box for 20 seconds every 30 minutes. This gave us plenty of heat, and you can see that every 30 minutes there was a reduction in humidity, but there was nowhere near enough airflow to clear the damp air, and the condensation kept building up quicker than the fan could clear it. Next I changed the timing for the fan to be on for 2 minutes and off for 15. My aim being to have the fan coming on for as long as possible without the indicated temperature dropping below 50 degrees C. And then the fan off for as long as possible without the condensation building up on the side of the box. 
we know that the fan on constantly keeps the condensation away but drops the temperature inside the box too much. If we get the balance just right we should be able to dry the foam quicker. Unfortunately we're now finding the limitations of my testing method. We all know that we're not going to be drying 50 grams of moisture out of a reel of filament so we need to be careful to tune the box correctly for filament and not for foam. Drop me a comment down below if you can think of a better material to use instead of the foam. The problem with using filament is you need to soak a good amount to see any difference in weight and it can get quite expensive. I decided to keep going with the foam for a little while because if nothing else it at least gives us a comparison to see if any of the mods actually make things better. So next I moved the air intake from the side to the front of the box. The big difference I found here was that the indicated box temperature wasn't dropping anywhere near as much, however the air temperature inside pretty much stayed the same. I believe this is because the air isn't really passing across the heating element and instead just passing through the top of the box only. It was at this stage that I started getting better results for foam drying efficiency. With the fan back to running constantly and with the vent in the front I managed a foam drying efficiency of 4.6 grams per hour. This is a pretty big 25% improvement in drying efficiency but as we've already discussed we're not trying to dry foam are we? The problem is that we know that foam needs to be warm for it to release its moisture. The fan running constantly reduces the internal temperature of the box too much. We only actually need the airflow to remove the damp air. What I believe is happening in this setup is that the airflow passing over the foam is doing more to dry it than the heat actually is. If the filament doesn't release any moisture at this temperature then we're not going to see any extra benefit from the airflow. So at this point I decided to pay more attention to the internal air temperature and humidity without the wet foam in the box. What I noticed was that the air temperature outside the box was actually having quite a big effect on the internal air temperature whether the fan was running or not. We're in the middle of winter here in the UK and I did a lot of the previous tests in the late summer and autumn when the ambient temperature was obviously a lot higher. In a lot of these tests the internal air temperature is barely getting above 30 degrees when I leave the box to run in my workshop. I decided to run one of the tests with the box inside my house overnight to see if it made any difference to the internal temperatures. Sure enough the internal box temperatures increased. To me this says that there's not enough insulation in the external walls of the Sunlu S1 to maintain the internal air temperatures that we want to see. This is obviously made worse when we then pour more cool air into the box when we're taking the damp air out. Just to prove the point I tried putting a folded towel over the top of the box for one of the runs and the internal temperature even in my workshop went up to 40 degrees. This is potentially a good tip if you just want to get your filament a little bit warmer who knows what filament this will work for. As part of another video where I test out printing with wet filament I found that putting the timer back into the 2 minutes on 30 minutes off was actually pretty good for keeping the humidity as low as possible and the temperature as high as possible inside the box. So we now have the ability to run the fan at the speed we want for the amount of time we want and we also have good airflow through the box which means that we don't have to run the fan as long to get the damp air out. This in turn helps to keep the heat up. So are we done? No, not yet. As I often find in these tests I end up with more questions than answers. Personally I think the best way to maximise this box for drying filament is to get the internal temperature up and the humidity down. This may mean that future mods will need to focus more on insulation, air circulation, intake air humidity and intake air temperature. That's what I think but what do you think? I have very intelligent subscribers and your comments give me a lot of ideas for mods and videos. Leave me a comment below with your ideas so that we can keep working on trying to make the most efficient filament dryer we can as there still doesn't really seem to be anything on the market that does the job properly. Click here for another video about drying filament or click here for another video you might enjoy. Thanks for watching.